From the campus of St. Louis University in St. Louis, Missouri, HEC-TV proudly presents St. Louis University's seventh annual Safety Across High Consequence Industries Conference, where safety meets business. Okay, good morning. My name is Manoj Patankar. I'm the VP for Academic Affairs at St. Louis University and also serve as the Executive Director for the Center for Aviation Safety Research. Uh, so this conference uh, today is hosted by the Center for Aviation Safety Research, which is uh, funded by the FAA, and we are absolutely thrilled, delighted, excited, really, really happy to have all of you with here uh, with us uh, today. On behalf of St. Louis University and Father Lawrence Biondi, I want to welcome you to St. Louis to this seventh Safety Across High Consequence Industries Conference. First, I want to express my special thanks to the organizing committee, Dr. Lou Halamek, Mr. Jim Bowie, Dr. Ken Mill, Dr. Tom Bigdapayton, Mr. Jeff Brown. Could you please stand and be recognized? <laughs> this committee has worked throughout the year to bring to you an impressive array of speakers. We really appreciate your efforts and your dedication. Thank you. Next, I want to acknowledge the efforts of our faculty and staff with the Center for Aviation Safety Research, Mr. Damon Larsell, Richard Steckel, Ms. Shelley Reichert, Tegan Reiser, Shatricia Stone, and Matt Vance, and Professor Terrence Kelly. Would you please rise and be recognized? <laughs> they have all worked tirelessly throughout the year to keep us organized and ensure that we deliver a well choreographed program. This conference, again, as I said, is funded by the FAA, so we certainly appreciate the FAA's uh, role in this. And this year, we also have the Higher Education Consortium TV, which is St. Louis's leading producer of education, arts, cultural television programming. The station receives major funding from St. Louis County Commission for Educational Media and is programmed by the Higher Education Consortium which is composed of 12 colleges and universities and 62 cooperating school districts in Greater St. Louis. HEC-TV is recording this conference and will produce a short video summarizing the conference. This video will be available on HEC-TV's website. I would also like to thank Ashgate Publishing not only for publishing our latest book, Safety Culture, but also for sending us a few copies of a variety of safety-related books which are on display back there. Order forms are also available for those of you who are interested in ordering any uh, books, and they have offered a special discount to the conference attendees. Now, a few words about the conference itself. We consider industries like aviation, healthcare, nuclear power, and offshore oil as high consequence industries. I guess we can now add banking and finance industry to that list as well. Okay. Because failure or errors in these industries cause serious harm to human life, in some cases hundreds of lives at a time. We want to bring practitioners and researchers from these industries together because we believe that there's a lot to be learned through sharing of challenges and best practices across these industries. Basically, we believe that we can learn from each other. We are all committed to safety, and this conference is about reframing our particular safety challenges from a different industry's perspective. It is about creating what we can call Eureka Moments by immersing practitioners and researchers from one industry into discussions about challenges and success stories from a completely different industry. We believe that such immersion is essential for innovation and it is this cross-disciplinary immersion that makes this conference unique. This year's theme is safety management, how to make it happen. Therefore, our focus is on practical solutions and success stories. Today, we'll hear about application of safety management principles in aviation, healthcare, railroad, and nuclear power. Tomorrow, we'll start with a keynote presentation by Captain Almadar from American Airlines and focus the day on hazard reporting concepts and safety leadership and ethics. We will hear again presentations from aviation, healthcare, and nuclear power. Finally, I want to thank all of our speakers and attendees for making this conference a priority. So thank you very much. Now, to start with our program, 
I would like to introduce our keynote speaker, Sister Mary Jean Ryan, a Franciscan Sister of Mary, is chair of the board of SSM Healthcare, one of the largest Catholic healthcare systems in the United States, with 23,000 employees and 5,800 affiliated physicians serving in 20 hospitals and two nursing homes. In 2002, SSM Healthcare became the first healthcare recipient of the Malcolm Baldrige National Quality Award, the nation's premier award for performance excellence and quality achievement. During her 25-year tenure as president and CEO, Sister Mary Jean emphasized three key themes, preservation of the Earth's resources, valuing ethnic and gender diversity, and commitment to continuous quality improvement. She is the author of On Becoming Exceptional, SSM Healthcare's Journey to Ballridge and Beyond, released in March 2007, and co-author of CQI and Re Renovation of an American Healthcare System, a Culture Under Construction, released in 1997. Sister Mary Jean received a nursing diploma from St. Mary's Hospital in Madison, Wisconsin, a Bachelor of Science degree in nursing from St. Louis University, and a master's degree in hospital and health administration from Xavier University in Cincinnati. She has been a Franciscan sister for, of Mary for 50 years. Please welcome Sister Mary Jean Ryan. Thank you very much and good morning everybody. Um, I really consider it a privilege uh, to have been asked to speak to you this morning and I want to thank you not only for inviting me but uh, also for listening. I do want to talk about our quality journey at SSM Healthcare and our use of the Baldridge uh, process. But as I do that, I'm also going to talk about organizational transformation because in my mind, Transformation and quality improvement are inextricably linked. And the reason that quality matters so much to those of us in the room is that it, it is also inherent in safety. If you don't have quality improvement, your safety efforts are not going to be any good either. But as, as we heard, we represent industries where mistakes can have tragic uh, implications and ramifications. When something goes wrong, the impact can be deadly. It's a weighty responsibility and one I know you're well aware of or you wouldn't be here. But before I get to the main point of my remarks, let me uh, offer you a story. This is about four hospital presidents, namely Joe, Sandy, Gasper, and Frank. Uh, one day, after many successful years, they got together over dinner to discuss the holiday gifts that they'd given to their elderly system CEO who lived in another city. And Joe said, well, you know, I thought she needed a new home, so I got her a huge house, and I had that built for her. And Sandy said, well, I thought she needed entertainment. So I had a $100,000 theater with Dolby Sound installed in that house for her. And Gasper said, well, I thought she needed transportation, so I had my Mercedes dealer deliver her an SL600 with a chauffeur. And Frank said, listen to what I got her. He said, you know how she loved reading the Bible. And you know she can't read anymore because she can't see. Well, I happened to meet this priest who told me about a parrot who could recite the entire Bible. It took 20 monks 12 years to teach him, and I got her that parrot. The other hospital presidents were very impressed. And after the holidays, the CEO sent the following thank you notes. Dear Joe, the house you built is so huge, I live in only one room, but I have to clean the whole house. Thanks anyway. <laughs> Dear Sandy, you gave me an expensive theater with Dolby sound. It could hold 50 people, but all my friends are dead. I've lost my hearing, and I'm nearly blind. I'll never use it. Thank you for the gesture, just the same. 
Dear Jasper, I'm too old to travel. I stay home. I have my groceries delivered, so I never use the Mercedes. And the driver you hired is even older than I am. The thought was good. Thanks. Dearest Frank, you were the only one to have the good sense to give a little thought to your gift. Thank you. The chicken was delicious. <laughs> well, I hope you'll find my remarks this morning, if not delicious, at least food for thought. I believe that the reason that we're here and the reason why our being here is so essential is that we in high consequence industries, especially, and I'm talking about healthcare, have a moral obligation to keep our patients safe. And for you, it's to keep your clients and customers safe. So I'm gonna talk about some of the things that we've done at SSM Healthcare to improve patient safety in the hopes that you'll be able to apply some of our learnings to your field. When it comes to patient safety, some people at SSM will tell you that I'm very demanding. Others will say I'm impossible to please. Certainly, that's what the physician said when I was supervisor of the operating room many, many years ago. However, after three and a half years, I learned that the operating room was no place for me. The reality was I was a relatively inexperienced supervisor, and my ability to be a really good operating room nurse was sadly lacking. However, I look back on my time there as a terrific learning experience, and even though people were very tolerant of me, I came to the conclusion that the OR was not where I should spend the rest of my life. That became very clear to me the day that we had an incident in the OR. I had come to expect less than stellar care from one particular surgeon. And after another, thankfully not fatal, serious incident, I remember asking one of our anesthesiologists if he would ever be willing to testify in court against the surgeon. And he told me, hell no. And I said, well, I sure would. And he said to me, but you're only a nurse. His comment reminded me of something you might, that might have been said years ago in a cockpit of a plane, something along the lines of, you're only the navigator. So back to how impossible to please I am, the truth of the matter is I am hard to please even though I'm no longer in the OR. In our organization, I never settle for less than the very best in patient care, and I constantly encourage employees and physicians to improve so that the care that we deliver is consistently exceptional in every way, every day. But right up front, I want to acknowledge we still have a long way to go. To illustrate how far, let me tell you a story. Three years ago, at one of our hospitals, we had a wrong site surgery. It's a terrible story. Briefly, the patient was a man in his late 50s with some cognitive disability. He was scheduled for laparoscopic surgery to remove a cancerous kidney. The surgeon confirmed with the patient which kidney needed to be removed and the site was marked. I'm not crying, I have terrible allergies, I'm sorry. The radiology report had not arrived in the OR suite at the time surgery was scheduled to begin, but the surgeon made the decision to begin without it. The following day, the lab report came back. The kidney that had been removed had no cancer. Of course, the surgeon, who is not only excellent at his profession, but he is also a very decent human being, did not believe the report. But what had happened was this. Somehow the original order from the doctor's office was incorrect. And because the patient was cognitively impaired, he did not correct the error. As soon as we realized what had happened, we disclosed our error and apologized to the patient and his family. The hospital president, the surgeon, and our risk manager were all present for the disclosure. In the words of the hospital president, and I quote this, 
It would have been easier if they had yelled and screamed at us, but they didn't. And he goes on to say it was devastating. We offered to do anything we could to help the patient, but the family asked that he be moved to another facility. A dark cloud seemed to settle over the whole hospital, especially the nursing staff. It was a feeling of intense shame. People were embarrassed that this could happen at our hospital. I don't think we fully recovered. And that was about a year later. And he goes on to say, there are no words to describe the effect on the surgeon. I was worried about him for a while, that he might take his own life. He performs, he's performing surgery again, but he's a changed person. If it were me, I'm not sure I could ever pick up a scalpel again." End quote. Well, this story is a far cry from consistently exceptional care. However, for every bad thing that happens at SSM, there are many, many good things. And one of them happened at another one of our hospitals. Just as surgery was about to begin there, a technician spoke up to point out that the patient's wrong side was about to be operated on. The surgeon listened, surgery was stopped, and a whole lot of heartache for a whole lot of people was avoided, all because the team was willing to listen to the technician. To put a dollar amount on what happens when people don't listen, even though surgical never events account for only 3% of all surgeries, the cost for employers is $1.5 billion annually. And of course, that says nothing about the physical and emotional harm to the patient. But getting back to why I'm with you today, I'm gonna to share with you some exceptional learnings from our quality journey, as well as some of what we've learned from Baldridge then I'm going to move to a topic that I think is absolutely essential today, and that is calling for the leadership that resides in all of us as a way to achieve organizational transformation. I believe that creating an organization of leaders must be a part of the vision of anyone who seeks to transform an organization and make it safe. But creating an organization of leaders is not easy, and it will take every bit of energy that can be mustered. So you have to be able to find enough energy for endurance over the long haul so that your commitment is unflagging, unwavering, and unabashed. And finally, you have to have the faith that you will eventually see your vision become a reality. I'm going to address three areas that I think are essential for organizational transformation. And the best way that I can think to describe the first area is the awakening, with apologies to the St. Louis novelist, uh, Kate Chopin. The awakening is that moment of truth when you get a slightly sick feeling in the pit of your stomach because you realize that things aren't as good as they should be. I'll talk briefly about my own awakening and how it influenced our subsequent efforts to improve. But it's one thing to be awakened, it's another thing to improve. And so I'll talk a little bit about how we use Baldridge uh, as a way to improve and how it influenced us and actually made us better. And then third, I'm gonna look at the non-scientific piece of organizational transformation. Some people call it leadership, others call it heart. I believe they're the same. So let me begin by talking about our awakening at SSM. To set the stage, uh, I have to go back a few years, actually all the way back to 1872. SSM Healthcare was actually begun that year, 140 years ago, uh, by five Catholic nuns, came to St. Louis from Germany. Obviously, SSM has grown through the years, and up until about 26 years ago, we were a group of some 20 plus hospitals and nursing homes that existed pretty much independently. In 1986, we came together as a formal health system, and I became the CEO that year. As the CEO, I had a vision. 
a daunting one at that, I believed that SSM healthcare could deliver healthcare breathtakingly better than it had ever been done before. But I knew we couldn't get to that point without incredible effort on the part of every single person in the organization. But back in 1986, in my new role as CEO with my vision firmly planted in my mind, I was eager to use some of the current management philosophies to engage our employees and physicians. So each year at our annual leadership conference, which we held at that time at Marco Island, Florida, we introduced a promising new philosophy with great hoopla and enthusiasm. Each one, we were certain, would be the one to transform the organization. Well, at the end of our very successful 1989 conference, where the focus had been servant leadership, I sat at the pool with another senior executive, uh, who, by the way, recently succeeded me as CEO of SSM last year. Both of us at that time had a vague feeling of unease. It seemed that no matter how much we communicated our system's mission and values, some things were just not happening. Despite our enthusiasm for these management philosophies, there was something missing. Looking back, that was our awakening. What we realized was this. Despite our serious commitment to various management philosophies and strategies over the years, we did not see a constant striving for improvement. We did not see managers mobilizing employees to work on projects that were important. And we did not see processes in place that made the best use of people's talents. In short, we recognized that we were not nearly as good as we could or should be. What I know now that I didn't realize at the time was this. There were two things that we were doing wrong. First, and this will be obvious to you, we were prone to the management flavor of the month syndrome. And second, it was always we, the senior executives, who were sending down the truth from the mountaintop to them, the employees. So as these thoughts surfaced in our conversation by the pool, we searched for an answer. We knew we had to find some way to tap the potential of all of our employees, something that would help us improve the complex processes that are inherent to healthcare. And we knew that whatever we did had to be for the long haul. Well, in that conversation, we learned that each of us had been hearing about the success of continuous quality improvement, commonly called at that time TQM. Mostly in other industries it was happening, but there were some beginnings in healthcare. And back in 1989, CQI seemed to show promise as a way to improve everything that we did. Well, to make a long story short, we did some homework, got to know more about CQI, and the more that we learned, the more we determined that it fit with our values, which was absolutely essential for us. And we implemented CQI system-wide in 1990 I'm not going to bore you with what it was like to make CQI the culture for 24,000 employees, 5,800 physicians, in seven regions, four states, and 20 plus entities. I'm going to leave it to you to imagine that scenario. Thankfully, at the time, I had no idea what the extent of our commitment would be. Back then, as an extremely impatient person, I was proud of the fact that I was willing to wait five years, which was the time I thought it would take to improve everything and actually be transformed. Now, 22 years later, I have to admit that we're still not where we need to be. Fortunately, our vision, our energy, and our faith help us endure in our journey to performance and excellence, and the good news is that we've changed significantly for the better. And all of that reminds me of the story of the Tibetan monk who ended up in New York City selling hot dogs at one of those hot dog stands on the street. A man walked up to the monk and said, give me a hot dog with everything on it, pickles, relish, mustard, ketchup, onions, everything. So the monk put the hot dog on the bun and piled it high with pickles, relish, mustard, ketchup, onions, and then gave it to the man. In return, the man handed him a $20 bill. The monk took the bill, thanked the man, and went on to serve the next customer. Uh, wait a minute, said the man, where's my change? 
And the monk looked at him and replied, true change comes from within. <laughs> well, at SSM, uh, true change really did have to come from within, but it wasn't easy. And this is the part of our story where I'll explain where, how we got from CQI to Baldridge. Very briefly, by the mid-90s, we had reached a plateau with CQI. The good news was continuous improvement had become our culture. The bad news was we weren't seeing the kind of results that we hoped for. As we looked for ways to move us forward, we became aware that companies and in other industries that were using the Baldridge criteria were significantly outperforming their, com their com competitors. And although healthcare in 1995 was not eligible for the Baldridge Award, we encouraged our facilities to apply for state quality awards, which not only had criteria for healthcare, but were patterned after Baldridge. Since our goal with the state quality awards was improvement, we were surprised and delighted when we actually began winning. The awards raised mor morale and heightened our resolve to continue to improve because now we actually had proof that we were beginning to see significant results at some of our facilities. So in 1999, when healthcare finally became eligible for the Baldridge, we submitted our application and became the first healthcare organization to receive a site visit. Now, you may not be familiar with the advantages of Baldridge. How many of you are? How many? Well, for us, it provided three very essential things a focus, a framework, and a discipline. Regarding discipline, describing your organization in 50 pages gives a whole new meaning to that word. Baldridge gives you the discipline to stop doing things just because you've always done them, even though they don't make sense anymore. The focus piece has to do with the fact that although our CQI culture was firmly established, our approach to improvement was scattered. As a result, it didn't have the impact it could have had. Baldridge helped us focus on what really mattered. And by framework, I mean that Baldridge helped us look at our organization in a new way. It gave us a new lens to look through, which enabled us to systematically evaluate our entire organization and understand the link between the hundreds of processes that make up the healthcare experience. Well, seeing things in a new way also reminds me of the experience of Robin, a 43-year-old woman who was taken to the hospital by ambulance after suffering a ruptured abdominal aortic aneurysm. On the operating table, she had a near-death experience and, and saw God. And she said, is my time up? No, God said, you have another 43 years, two months, and eight days to live. Well, Robin was so relieved to hear the news that with all those years to live, she decided to have a complete makeover. She had a facelift, lip enhancement, breast augmentation, and a tummy tuck. After her last surgery, she was released from the hospital, and as she was crossing the street to get to her car, she was hit and killed by a truck. Arriving in heaven, Robin confronted God. I thought you said I had another 40 years. She said angrily, why didn't you pull me out of the path of that truck? Oh my, God exclaimed, Robin, I didn't recognize you. <laughs> I know. Well, with Baldridge, we did not recognize just how different it was from anything that we'd ever done before. In fact, it was almost like learning a foreign language. But we embraced it with vigor. Two years before healthcare would become eligible to apply, we actually did a self-assessment to become familiar with the language as well as identify major gaps between the Baldrige criteria at that time and what we saw as our own reality. And we found plenty of gaps, some of them quite fundamental. The most significant for us was the lack of a common mission statement uh, used throughout the system. For SSM, as I'm sure it is for you, the mission is our lifeblood, the fundamental reason why we do what we do. When our system was formed in 1986, we had directed each entity to have its own mission statement and values because we value local autonomy as well as geographical differences. And the entities did their job very well, so well that in 1998, 
we had enough mission and value statements to fill 21 single-spaced pages. Is it any wonder that we weren't focused? To make matters worse, we had a system mission statement that was 85 words long. And it had been written by a committee at the corporate level. We knew we had a problem. So in 1998, we began a process to re-articulate our mission and values. Nearly 3,000 employees from every level of the organization, from every one of our entities, participated. It took them a full year. And today our mission statement is 13 words, short by design, and the best thing about it is it was discovered from within. We realized that the development of a mission statement must involve as many people in the organization as possible and the process can't be rushed. If a solid mix of employees has not helped create the mission statement, it will not truly belong to them, and the potential to transform an organization will be hindered. So here's our mission statement, 13 words. Through our exceptional healthcare services, we reveal the healing presence of God. Through our exceptional health care services, we reveal the healing presence of God. It's short, it's simple, it's profound. Because the mission and values came from our employees, they embraced them as their own. And let me tell you a story to illustrate that. Um, many of you know of Cardinal Glennon uh, Children's Medical Center in St. Louis uh, here. It's a very special place. And there's an OR nurse there who's also a very special person. Um, and I'll just call her uh, Barb. One day, Joey, a seven-year-old boy, arrived at Glennon in the surgical suite with two black eyes and a split lip. When Barb examined him further, she saw horrible bruises all over his body. He was in renal failure and had a lacerated spleen. And he told Barb his uncle had done it. Well, following state law, Glennon reported the case and the boy's mother and uncle were arrested and subsequently sent to jail. In the meantime, Joey faced months in the hospital alone. Barb felt that she was a familiar face, so she visited him every day. As the days became weeks, Barb applied to become licensed as a foster parent. She realized that Joey could at least come to her house when he was ready to go home. One thing led to another. Barb brought her husband and daughter to meet the boy, and like Barb, they fell in love with him too. After three months in the hospital, Joey was finally ready to go home, and he did, to Barb's home. In August, just six months after meeting him, her family adopted Joey. At first, he was a handful, uh, but he's calmed down a lot, and Barb thinks it's because he feels safe. He knows no one will hurt him there. When he grows up, Joy wants to be a firefighter because he wants to save people's lives. You see, even though I was technically the boss at the time, the mission of SSM Healthcare no more belonged to me than it did to Barb. Sure, I was the CEO, but for Joy, Barb truly brought meaning to life, the meaning of exceptional. And through her exceptional health care services, Barb extended the SSM health care mission to Joey. Through her care and compassion, the healing presence of God was revealed. Well, the healing presence of God was definitely not revealed to one of our corporate office employees who had surgery at another one of our hospitals. She happened to mention where she worked in response to a question as she was being wheeled into the operating room. Gee, one of the nurses said to her, can you let them know at corporate that we need more help in here? Not exactly the words you want to hear before you undergo surgery. <coughs> Fortunately, she survived, uh, but that was an example of what our mission is not about. Some people think that this mission stuff is something soft, but I can speak with assurance 
if it is done right, it may be the most difficult thing that you've ever done. However, if it is done right, a mission statement will touch the very souls of everyone in the organization and the people being served. So for us at SSM, mission and values must also be an internal guidepost to our own behavior. Because if we don't treat one another well, how can we ever expect that our patients will feel that they've experienced the healing presence of God? Healing, as you know, often happens at the strangest times when people's guards are down and the spirit comes through, but more on that later. But now back to Baldridge. Beginning in 1999, the year healthcare became eligible, we applied for four consecutive years, always with significant learnings from the feedback, which always led to significant improvements. Baldridge also has a great value as a business model because it offers a structured way to look at an organization. It asks very basic questions, but coming up with answers is often very hard. And quite frankly, I do think that it is the best way to get better faster because of the feedback that you receive from the application and the site visit. So what did we learn? Well, among many other things, the feedback pointed out the glaringly obvious about our mission statement, which was, you say you want to deliver exceptional healthcare services, yet you haven't defined exceptional and you certainly can't measure them until you define them. And further it said, you say you want to be exceptional and you're using national averages as comparative data. In our defense, that was the best data that we could find back then and we could proudly say that we were better than average in most places and most things. In effect, they reminded us that our mission statement does not say, through our better than average healthcare services, we reveal the healing presence of God. You know, and I hate when that happens. Um, you know, the, the Baldrige feedback always causes you to say, I can't believe we didn't see that. But the reality is that those of us in any organization are too close to it. We're myopic. So of course, that's the value of having an external review. This external review comes in the form of a site visit. On our site visits, uh, we were provided an opportunity and the examiners came for two reasons, to verify what we had said in our application and then clarify any questions that they had as a result of the application. But the best part of the site visits was that they gave employees an opportunity to shine. All over the system, employees had fun and took great pride in talking about the work that they do. As you may have guessed, we spent considerable time making improvements based on the feedback. Best of all, we figured out how to translate our mission imperative, that is exceptional healthcare services into specific and measurable goals, and we stopped comparing ourselves to the average. We now set goals based on nationally recognized best practices both within and outside of healthcare. So Baldridge has given us a mantra. Define, measure, monitor, improve. Define, measure, monitor, improve. We're determined to continue to improve every day in every way and by constantly focusing on process improvements we hope to achieve stellar results in everything that we do. Our commitment to improve is driven by our belief that we have an obligation, as I said before. Actually, it goes further than that. We have a sacred trust <laughs> to deliver health care better than it's ever been done before. So what I can say without hesitation that it, our commitment to CQI and Baldrige has made us a very different organization than we were in 1995 and even in 2010, and will be even better five years from now. There are no shortcuts. I wish I could say there were. As much as we want it to, nothing happens overnight. Rather, it is only persistent and focused attention to process improvement that will yield results, the kind of results that our patients deserve and that our integrity demands. So to summarize, the first two areas essential for organizational transformation 
First, the awakening, the recognition that we were not as good as we could be. That occurred in 1989. What we did about it was CQI, uh, which eventually led to Baldridge. And as a result of Baldridge, we are at a new place, a far better place than we ever were before. Not nearly good enough, but certainly better. So let me move to the third area. This is the intangible piece that I call heart. And I want to give you an example of what I mean. It's from uh, the book, My Grandfather's Blessings, by Rachel Naomi Raymond, a physician. Dr. Raymond says this, and I quote her, the ways and means by which people serve may vary from time to time and from culture to culture, but the nature of service has not changed since our beginnings. No matter what means we use, service is always a work of the heart. There are times when the power of science is so seductive that we may come to feel that all that is required to serve others is to get our science right, our diagnosis, our treatment. But science can never serve unless it is first translated by people into a work of the heart." End quote. Well, Dr. Raymond tells the story of Molly, one of her former patients who was hospitalized with fractures of both elbows. Molly had been in an automobile accident as she was driving to the airport in a city 2,000 miles from her home. When she awoke in the hospital, her arms were encased in rigid casts that went from her shoulders to her wrists. While Molly has multiple food allergies and other very special dietary needs and could have become dangerously ill if she inadvertently had eaten the wrong things. So it was critical that her food needs were addressed while she was in the hospital. Soon after she was settled into her bed, the dietician took more than an hour to carefully document her unusual food needs. The questions that she asked were so thoughtful, Molly told Dr. Raymond, she really knew her stuff. In all these years, no one has ever asked me some of those questions or understood so quickly and completely how things were with me. I was really impressed. Well, within a few hours, special food was ordered for Molly. Three times a day, the food was served to her by food service staff who brought it to her bedside on a tray and put it before her on her bed table. Then they left. The first time this happened, she told Dr. Raymond, I just sat there looking at the food, unable to feed myself. I was certain that someone would come to help me, but no one ever did. After a while, the woman in the next bed noticed that I could not eat. Trailing her own IV lines, she had gotten out of bed and fed me my dinner. The same thing had happened at every meal in the four days that Molly was in the hospital. Without the use of her arms, no one on the staff ever helped her to eat. Day after day, the right food would be brought in and the patient in the next bed would feed it to her. Now, you may be thinking, and rightly so, say what? Why didn't Molly ask for help? That's absurd. It is absurd. But how often are patients invisible in the healthcare environment? How often do we create situations in which patients have no voice, despite the fact that they're the greatest authorities all about themselves? You know, I hate to think that something like Molly's story could happen at SSM Healthcare or any hospital for that matter. We want the hospital experience to be a positive one in which the patient is safe, receives the highest quality care, and experiences caring and compassion from everyone with whom they come in contact. So as um, I come to the end of my remarks, let me offer a further, further thought from Rachel Naomi Raymond, and she says this. She says there's a parable about the difference between heaven and hell. In hell, people are seated at a table overflowing with delicious food. 
but they have splints on their elbows. And so they cannot reach their mouths with spoons. They sit through eternity, experiencing hunger in the midst of abundance. In heaven, people are also seated at a table overflowing with delicious food. They too have splints on their elbows and cannot reach their mouths. But in heaven, people use their spoons to feed one another. She goes on to say that perhaps hell is always of our own making. In the end, the difference between heaven and hell may only be that in hell, people have forgotten how to bless one another. So, as I leave you, um, I hope you won't think I'm presumptuous if I would offer you my personal blessing. May you be blessed with enough challenges to keep life interesting, but not daunting. May you know the infinite goodness that resides within you. May you enjoy peace and happiness. And may you never forget how to bless one another. Thank you all very much, and God bless you. Uh, good morning. I'm Jim Bowie, um, also a member of the steering committee for the, the conference for the last several years. Um, I'd like to also extend my welcome to all of you for joining us in this uh, great group of uh, sharing people. There's a couple things that I'd like to talk about very shortly on uh, today's agenda, the topics that we're going to be talking about, and how that fits in to our overall plans. Uh, first of all, you, you all typically are from industries that have the potential of having dire consequences, uh, where you can, uh, if something is done wrong, your product or your service can have some pretty harmful effects on customers or the general public. You, but I will submit to you that if you're in that kind of business, and you've been in that kind of business for some period of time that shows that you have some success in that line of business, my contention is you have a safety management system. Because in effect, if you didn't, you wouldn't be in business. Now the question is, how good is that safety management system? And can it be made better? And in almost all cases, it can be. What we're attempting today to do is get a little more familiar with safety management systems. We represent several different industries in the room, and some of these industries have had a very long uh, formal record of having safety management systems. Others are just starting that journey of formality about that type of thing, and some haven't even uh, learned to spell SMS yet but are interested in learning about it. So we're coming from different places and we have lots of different experiences to share. Um, what I'd like to also do is uh, see how we're going to learn from each other in these things. Today we're going to get briefed on what are the basic principles of SMS that are seen and exhibited through the different industries. There's a lot of commonality in the basic principles. And then we're also gonna find out some of the differences, how they are tweaked to fit the business realities of the different types of businesses like rail transportation, aviation, healthcare, uh, food industry, and so forth. Um, it's obvious through a lot of the literature that you've seen in the last decade that Integrating your practices into a specific way of doing business is the most efficient way to accomplish that. So things like the Toyota production system, quality management systems, they're all attempts to pull together everything into a set way of doing business. And if you can integrate all of your uh, business objectives into a set, single, comprehensive way of doing business, it's extremely efficient and effective. Today, I'm going to propose to you that there's also a benefit to every now and then stepping back from that fully integrated approach, taking a slice through it 
with a lens of safety only to make sure that what you've integrated hasn't been lost. That the pieces that you are trying to attend to in pulling together a safety objective or a safety management system aren't lost in the integration with all other business aspects. Same is true if you're gonna look at just quality, finance, uh, human uh, relations. There are lots of different focuses that go into a fully integrated comprehensive management system. It behooves us all to every now and then step back, take a look at it from one of those lenses to make sure we haven't lost a piece of it and then put it back into the integrated way of doing business. Looking today's, at today's agenda, we're gonna learn more about how different industries have de developed and implemented their safety management systems. And we're gonna understand the different elements that go into it. And that serves as a model for us to take a look at our own practices, to see if the safety management informal or formal systems that we have in place have any gaps, any issues that we need to address. It's a model to compare ourselves against to look for improvements. It's also a way to understand how one industry may be or how one element in one industry is tackling uh, the implementation of different pieces of that. It gives us some more ideas. And that's what this conference is really about, sharing those ideas. We don't want everybody to have to go out and and uh, discover on their own what somebody in the chair next to them here has already figured out. We want to share those practices. Which leads me to the last piece. Um, you are all invited to, a, to come to this conference, but you are not invited to attend the conference. You are invited to participate in the conference. And one of the golden things that we have seen over the years has been the interaction amongst the participants and including the speakers and presenters and the participants in the audience. The give and take is the richest piece of the information exchange and benefit that we can get out of this conference. So let me ask for a real quick show of hands. How many of you here are from the healthcare area? How many of you are from education? Aviation? Rail or other transportation? Chemical oil? Nuclear? Let's presume then that the industries that you're working in are ones that you are experts in. And we'll give everybody the benefit of the doubt. But that probably also means you're not very expert in the other industries. So there's lots of things to learn here. And there are no dumb questions. So if you don't understand something somebody is, is uh, presenting or describing or throwing you a loop for the acronyms on, ask. That's going to initiate the discussion. That's going to initiate the richest form of, of knowledge transfer that we can get from this conference today. So again, I strongly recommend that you don't be afraid of asking dumb questions. There are great questions out there. There are great answers to be shared. So please participate actively. Thank you. <laughs>